You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 156 of Arsenal Pass. Brendan Patrick, officially three years of Arsenal Pass. This is our three-year podcast. Congratulations, I guess. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I do. Cons- I am consistently jarred, if that is, if you can use the word like that. It is jarring when people mention flesh and blood and they say something like four years or five years old, and I'm just like, what? Mm. <laughs> it just doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, it's crazy how time passes, but yeah. Arsenal Pass, three years. Been a, it's definitely been a ride. It's, I think the, the journey of, of anything that you do gets particularly interesting after the one to two year mark because you come out of, I guess, what is kind of the honeymoon phase. Like, the, you know, we were very much grinding, uh, just like in the mix of it, trying to be successful. Like, you know, we were hustling at the beginning and then you kind of settle into what is like the, you know, maturing as a channel, maturing as content creators. And it's, yeah, it's interesting how the context of everything changes as you exit that one to two years and you kind of get into this three year plus range. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm percent. I mean, we're going to talk a little about reflect a little bit on the three years of Arsenal Pass so far, uh, but there's a lot of other things we've got to talk about in this pod, uh, quite a bunch of stuff, you know, a few things, number of things have happened over the past week, Brendan. We've seen new cards. We've seen new cards, not only for Part Must Fail, including just this morning before we jumped on to record, there's been more cards dropped for Part as well. I don't remember a set that's had quite this many cards. I know Alice has kind of seemed to, every set we go on now, more cards seem to be revealed early. You know, they, they bred Crumman a little bit more than yeah. these two. Do you remember where I'm, you know, where th- three year pod reflecting back on our, our time previously, but the first ever pod we did was a Monarch spoiler season video. And that was like, two or three weeks before Monarch dropped. And those are the first Monarch cards we've basically seen. How, how times have changed. I remember getting spoilers and then telling us that they could, uh, they only have the capability to do spoilers in like one weekend. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> I feel like they're, yeah, they're so fast. Yeah, breadcrumbing them is just way better because every, every single card that gets uh, spoiled, like as you space them out, is just another sort of tool in the toolbox. And there's just a cool story and narrative that, get, that goes along with that. So I prefer that much more. I don't think we're there yet. It's probably still going to be a bunch released on the same weekend, but it is cool to get them sort of dripped out like this. I think it's a vastly superior system for spoilers. I, mean, I really like a good preview season like a good spoiler season but i do think that you know you can build hype beforehand i love that they preview the heroes at the banquet for instance like that built Mm -hmm. such excitement you know you've got all these people in a room who are there to play the game who are excited about what james and the team have to say and hear about part of the and then as you go on you know give something every week right you know where i mean to be fair we're not far off the the preview season which is actually pretty exciting um and you know the world premiere is like six and a bit weeks away at this point. So, um, you know, we're getting closer and closer. And I think it's, yeah, it's such a, I think it is a cool way to do it, but I still like that kind of traditional preview season because I think it's, you know, for a couple of days, whatever it is, even, I think for a while we were getting too many cards in one go. Like you say, you know, there were some days we were getting like 30, 35 cards. Like that's a lot, <laughs> but you know, a dozen over a weekend is pretty cool. Um, and I think, you know, as we move towards this, this new kind of world premiere, system i guess you know where they're having these world premieres for every set basically they've said for for the next set after this you know tampa bay is happening for the world premiere as well these cards do need to be previewed earlier because uh, to make a sort of i guess uh, an even playing field especially if you're going to japan and you're going to play with japanese cards on draft on day two of the world premiere calling then you need to know what these cards do so you know basically all these cards are going to be previewed about the week before or at least the monday of the of the event so um you know it's getting sooner and sooner you know it used to be like the pre-release by the time we get to the pre-release the set is fully revealed people have played with the Solved. set multiple times <laughs> but do you know what like i think it's a it's a fine trade-off because not everyone gets to experience that with the world premiere and then people get to go to their their local events and, and play their pre-release and it's it's almost like a release event now rather than pre-release and i, I think that's okay it's pretty standard in tcgs nowadays that mm-hmm. like pre-releases don't feel like they felt i don't know even like five plus years ago, they're just, they do feel like releases. It feels like if the set's been out for a week and it's been played like 
a shitload online. You know, people have been <laughs> solving it uh, in regards to limited. They've been doing drafts. Like that is just how modern TCGs are right now, which I can understand why that would, you know, it's probably a bit of bummer. Some people that show up to pre-release and it's just a bunch of spikes, but um, I don't mind it. I think the world premiere system is fantastic. Like the few world premieres that I played, I thought were awesome. Like they were super fun. That felt like an old school pre-release to me. It was like mm, when I does, actually yeah. opened up those uprising cards in Vegas for like the first time and I like hit you up an hour or two before the tournament because you were ahead in a different time zone in Australia. I'm like, yo, give me, give me the tips. You're just like, bye. And I was like, okay, six up, easy. <laughs> so you are the spike also maybe if um you know there wasn't a certain channel creating preview you know um videos on how to win your pre-release <laughs> and set reviews and things like that maybe you wouldn't be creating spikes brendan that's all i'm saying <laughs> yeah uh, they are very cool well the i mean i had an amazing time at uh the the calling queenstown and the heavy hitters rev- uh, world premiere it did feel like you say like a, an old school pre-release which is is very cool so anyway Let's get into the news. Let's talk a little bit about Armory Deck KO. So if you if you hadn't heard this already at uh, the banquet at Pro Tour LA, James and the team announced that we'd be getting these ready to play classic instructed decks that you could buy off the shelf. You know, they're, they're a bit more powered up than we'd seen previously. You're ready to crack open and play at your local Armory. I think this is a product that we've been talking about for a very long time in terms of something that we felt was, well, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Brendan, but I've been saying for a long time, I've wanted to see this product and it's here and it's interesting. I think, you know, we had been told that they would be putting in unique cards. Uh, we've seen a couple of these unique cards already and this deck, I think this deck is going to come out in a month or so. So it's going to, it's going to a little bit before it comes out uh, or a couple of weeks, but the Armory Deck KO is going to be the first one that drops uh, available to play. And I don't know, have you seen these new cards, Brendan? Mm-hmm. These cards that we're getting exclusively? So I actually watched the DMR Armada will- video about them as well. Um, just because, uh, I mean, this is a huge point of contention. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think if there, there's actually no beneficial reason, like, towards the player base, like, why there should be unique cards in this other than like maybe if they don't sell they just can't do this kind of product and if they don't put unique Mm -hmm. cards in there it won't sell like that's the only value prop i can get and that's like a stretch so yeah i i mean it's standard in the tcg industry um it doesn't really buy my respect as a player actually it just loses it more and more every single time they do something like this and it hurts me as a player financially and i feel like you know, a bit disenfranchised. But at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. I think a lot of people like to hype it up. They like to blow it out of proportion. And it's like a, it's a huge thing to talk about on Twitter. But ultimately, if they keep doing this, will it make me quit the game? No, <laughs> but it just, I would rather it not be like that. That's really all I can say. Mm. I mean, it is pretty par for the course. And like you say, another TCGs as well um, to, to have product releases. I mean, so we know we have three, at the moment, three main sets a year, um, three set releases, and then in between, we're getting product releases. Yeah, and I, th- you know, these ones that do have <laughs> these ones that do have unique <laughs> cards in them. Obviously, that's I guess the 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 marketing for this product is towards new players, but obviously, there's going to be enfranchised players that want this product as well because of the cards, the new they, cards, uh, the exclusive cards. Legend Story doesn't discriminate. They'll take money from new players, experienced players, whoever, whoever. Um, it's just funny because as we talk about, you know, Arsenal past three years of, three years of Arsenal past and now four to five years of flesh and blood, I mean, and the product releases, like you were talking about, like we're having the multiple, the assess per year, but then we're also having these additional products. It's like, the tone in the strategy is changing. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Hard to say. Is it incongruent with the original pitch of the game that we were sold? Mm, I mean, it, this is kind of like Flesh and Blood came out and they're like, Magic is doing this. We will not do that. And then we see stuff like this. So I don't know. I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to play devil's advocate and have like a reasonable position that's like anti-unique cards in these things, because ultimately I don't feel very passionate about it. But I want to present in a way that's like actually palatable because I think that when you go to Twitter, you get the very polarizing and extreme opinions on both ends where it's like, it doesn't matter because these cards are not impactful. You guys are just you guys are stupid. And then the other people are like, this is so immoral and overly capitalistic, I'm quitting the game. And it's like the real truth is probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you don't want to talk about how busted and broken these are and how insane it is i mean we can we do need to talk about these cards in a second but yeah i i mean i'm gonna sit on the side of 
I'm going to prefer this to having an actual set every month. I mean, I there's a reason I had to stop playing. No, I had to, but wanted to stop playing Magic with the set release schedule. It, it got kind of insane. But I think a product, I'm okay with a product every month if I don't care about majority of those products. Um, you know, I don't care about them, but they're not, they're not relevant to me. Um, so I will see. We'll see how relevant, like, you know, if it turns out there's five or six cards per armory deck that I want to get my hands on, that starts to become a, a bit of a different proposition. But, you know, again, yeah. not everyone plays every every class and every hero, right? So, yeah, there's, 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 uh, there's slices that they slice into of, of the consumer base. Yeah. And I think that's okay. And then what happens when the supply is low and these things actually start getting scalped and those cards are prohibitively expensive wow. as well? That's obviously, that's, yeah, that, that, that would be the real issue. That would be the, the true issue if that is, if that is to happen. Yeah, anyway, we'll see. Let's talk about these cards. So Savage Sash is a brute equipment chest majestic that comes in the armory KO deck. It defends for two, it has temper and action. Destroy this, attack action cards with six or more attack, cost one less to play this turn. Go again. Th this card is good. That's Th what this I card said. Is Everybody on Twitter said it sucked though. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. I don't understand how people are saying this card sucks. I think this card is really good. Um, it's extremely confusing to me. So, I mean, the way I think I evaluate this card is KOs are currently playing hard and cross trap in the deck to get two resources on a particular turn because Tunic, maybe the game isn't going to go more than four or five turns. You're going to get two resources off Tunic, right? So, all of a sudden, you've got, you know, you're a hard and cross trap effectively if you're going to play two attacks in a turn, which is what KO wants to do, right? Mm -hmm. If wants to play two, two attacks in a turn on a big turn, uh, it's a little bit more restrictive, right? In some ways, you can't just pop it for two resources, but you also get two block off this and potentially three block instead of the resources. I think this card is really good. I don't think it's going to replace Tunic as the main equip chest equipment we're seeing KOs use right now. KO, you know, it's, it can be a reasonably grindy deck from time to time. But I think this gives another avenue for KO to play more aggressively as a more dominant plan. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, more, more block, more fridge. Um, KO's fridge is already getting pretty big. Pretty it's beefy. Yeah, it's interesting because you said it won't replace Tunic. Um, like, I think it will just be an option <laughs> right like if you're playing yeah, it, playing exactly. in a more aggressive matchup you know the game's not going to go very long like uh in the in i guess in ode to tark patel's recent post on on ko scabskin leathers and plus ev gaming you will just when you can just do the math right you can just figure out it's like oh i'm not going to reach two tunic resources this game's going to be very short i'm just going to play my savage sash because this is an aggressive matchup the block is really important and i will simply just get more value off of this card so i think it's going to be coming to a sideboard near you mm -hmm. it might even be three resources right like if you're not going to get three resources then you don't play this because the two block is it's pretty relevant you know there's a lot of decks that are trying to attack care with on it effects so but i i I'm not, yeah, I think this presents an option to build KO in a different way, to play it in different matchups. I think ultimately the, the card is, it's going to be a staple probably in lists depending on the meta. Uh, let's talk about Run Rough Shot. It's a um, Brute Action Attack Rare at blue. We don't know if this is a cycle, but we're seeing blue. I'm going to assume this is not a cycle, Brendan, because um, it might be quite good. But this is blue. Attacks of five, defense of three, cost one, and says play this only if you've discarded a card with six or more attack this turn. Uh, this is a really good blue. <laughs> yeah. So how much does this cost again? I can't really see the top right. There. One, one. Just yeah. One. That's balanced. Resource. Okay. One for five. If you've discarded a card with six or more attack this turn, which you know in brute you want to do quite a bit of. So a one cost five at blue is is pretty powerful. Obviously, if this is at yellow, uh, as a Rhino, I'm as a Rhino player. I would like to see this in yellow, please. Um, red would be super powerful. So I don't know if they're going to print a cycle of this, but I guess we'll find out. Yeah, maybe I don't understand Brute. Maybe I'm going off on a limb, but I think if it was a cycle, it's not balanced. It seems a bit powerful. Like uh, the, the, hoop, the hoop jumping you're doing here is not extensive for a one cost seven attack, potentially. Right? Yeah, we got Gravelin Growl. Leviathan's already got Gravelin Growl. Same thing. Maybe you have to play Leviathan. <laughs> <laughs> Blood that. I mean, they have shout, shout, out, shout out to Michael Jasker on that one, you know. Yeah, Leviathan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so those are the cards that we've seen so far from Armory Deck KO. I want to keep us moving. We've got a lot to cover in the pod. Let's talk about some of the previews from Pup as well. We've seen quite a few cards over the last 48 to 72 hours. The first are these promo cards that are coming with, um, I believe these are from the world premiere. These are cold foil promos that we've seen, and they're obviously going to be in the set as well. These are the Chakras. I know you tweeted out about this because you 
every time there's a card that may or may not be relevant against Kano, you absolutely lose your mind and well, post it. And I this, was pretty no, tame it's a meme it. at this point. I was tame. I was very, I, I, I had a very political answer. I just said, every single time they print something like this, I die a little bit inside. And it's true. It's true. Um, we'll get to that card I thought you end. posted. I thought you posted, and I quote, LSS hates Kano. Dude, I did not say that. But that is true as well. Um, but I did not say that. I did not say that. Um, I was actually replying too, so I'm surprised you even saw the tweet. That was on like somebody else's Oh, tweet. I see it all. I see it's it all. Just got, all right. It's got noties on. <laughs> I definitely do. Let's talk about these. First is Tide Chakra. Uh, this is a... Tide Chakra is a Mystic Assassin attack reaction. These are promos. We don't know what rarity there's going to be. Uh, this one defends for three. Cost one, it says target assassin or mystic attack action card gets plus three. If you've transcended this turn, it gets plus five attack instead. Okay. Seems I'm good. I'm just going to read this. We can talk, we can talk yeah, about it all together. Ex- Moon Chakra. I'm excited for the, by the way, just real quick. I'm excited for how many people try to play this on a generic attack because that will happen. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, the, the interesting thing, right, is that it looks like just... I'm going to talk about something afterwards. I'll, talk, I'll read these out and then we'll talk about them. Uh, Moon Chakra is a Mystic Illusionist instant. It costs zero. It does not defend. It says the next time you would be dealt damage this turn, prevent three of the damage. If you've transcended this turn, instead prevent five. And then Wind Chakra is a Mystic Ninja action. Costs zero. Defends for three. It says the next Crouching Tiger you play this turn gets plus three. If you've transcended this turn, it gets plus five attack. Instead, has a go again. Um, so one thing I want to point out, right, is that these hit either the class or the mystic or mystic so what looks interesting to me for limited especially is that these cards can kind of keep you a little bit open to a degree in terms of you know they can hit on your uh, assassin attacks if i'm taking tai shaka for instance or they could hit any mystic attack but they can't hit generics like you say so that's a new kind of a little bit of a newer way to look at the slicing the pie i think when it comes to how you look at limited in terms of like staying open um the the ability to flex cards in and out i think that's actually quite interesting so excited to see how that kind of plays out mm-hmm. um wind chakra looks like a zero for five if you transcend it that seems pretty good and that is very good <laughs> that is very good so it's just the the hoop of having a crouching tiger consistently is the question um mm-hmm. i think moon chakra is better than oasis or sort um, well, it depends, right? How easy is it to transcend? Uh, so I think zero for three is still better than one for four. Uh, one for five. Yeah, one for five. I think zero for three is probably <laughs> still better with AB. Like, uh, Oasis is a bit overkill. But yeah, Oasis zero, is zero for five maybe is more like flexible, I guess. DG yeah, I mean, yeah, Oasis yeah. is. Well, this is actually flexible too, which is kind of fucking annoying. <laughs> this is pretty flexible. It's also just damage. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really going to come down to Transcend. And I, I think these cards look super interesting to me in a, a limited context. But I mean, Tide Chakra, the fact it defends three, costs one as a, a reaction. You know, at, at worst, this is kind of a three block, almost Razor Reflex-like card. Or maybe not Razor Reflex, but some of the cards we saw similar in Outsiders, right, from an attack reaction standpoint. Like, these cards do look powerful. I assume these are going to be rares. Um, we don't know the rarity yet. But we've also seen some other cards. So we talked about how easy or how hard is it to Transcend. We have seen three legendaries which have been printed um let me just bring these up as well yeah. and just so uh just for anybody listening um legendary is not the rarity in case you're coming from yes. another game it is actually it means you can only play one in your deck <laughs> yeah so we don't actually know the rarity again these are promos i'll read these out the first is uh sacred so these are all three the three cycles of sacred art basically sacred art undercurrent desires this is the mystic assassin instant it costs three it's at blue it does not defend. Uh, it's a legendary, as Brendan says. So it has the legendary type. You may only have one sacred art under current desires in a constructed deck. Oh, it also now says constructed deck. So you can play multiple of these in limited, Brendan. <laughs> that did not used to be the case with legendary something like yeah, legendary that type. Yeah, is, that is, uh, I've never read that text in my life and I didn't even read it yep. when I was looking at these cards. So that's funny. I know, I've just read it now. It says, if you've played another blue card this turn, choose three. Otherwise, choose one. And they all say this. And then they say, this one says specifically, create a fang strike don't know what fang strike is and slither in your hand also don't know what slither is because we'll find out the second option is banish up to two cards in an opposing hero's graveyard and the third is transcend so there's your way to transcend right yep uh you've got sacred art jade tiger domain this is a mystic ninja instant it costs three at blue it has the legendary type again it says if you've played another blue card this turn choose three otherwise choose one create two crashing tigers in your hand your crashing tigers get plus one attack this turn 
transcend. Sacred Art, Immortal Lunar Shrine. This is the Mystic Illusionist instant. Cost three, again at blue. All the same text, except the options are create two spectral shield tokens, put a plus one counter on each aura with ward you control, or transcend. So you found your way to transcend there. If you've played a blue previously, these cards become pretty above rate, like pretty significantly above rate, right? Uh, we were talking about uh, the illusionist one before we yeah, jumped Yeah, they're, they're actually above rate without um, without without playing a blue. And for, at least for the illusionist, right? Because you can look at uh, blue prismatic shield, which creates one spectral shield, I believe, if I remember correctly. So this is strictly above rate to that. Both cards block for zero. They, um, yeah. I guess, I guess... Comparative to some other cards that are printed before, they are slightly yeah. above the yeah. rate of that card those is terrible, unplayable fucking cards. Terrible. Yes, it is. But it <laughs> it is like when you're looking at the design of the cards, it's it's cool that we can draw the the, the comparison because this card yes. is strictly double rate, which is actually pretty nuts. Because even if you don't play the blue, it's like it's just a lot. <laughs> it's like from yeah, the yeah. I I don't disagree. I think as soon as I mean maybe it's not the case with some of the others, but as soon as you yeah, as soon as you get to these three abilities, so once you've played another blue for the turn. I mean, obviously, the, the, the kind of thing, and this is the interesting design space of the set, is playing blues is generally pretty bad value, right? Mm-hmm. Just comparative to playing reds. So as soon as you start to increase the value or you exponentially increase things with, you know, if you've played another blue, then gain all three options. Now, all of a sudden, your blue, your sacred art starts to look a little bit like a red. Um, and that's when I think it becomes interesting. Obviously, that's balanced by the fact these are instants and they don't block. But again, balanced off by the fact that these are blues and you can pitch them. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I think this these cards are going to be busted, to be honest. Like, that's probably that, the intention as well. Yeah, I think that's why they're legendary. I think this is going to be rare. I think this is going to have an impact on Limited. The the one thing that keeps standing out to me about the set so far is blues, to me, mean resource base, and blues, good blues in a resource base mean consistency. Mm-hmm. And so the set, to me, feels like it could be set up to be really consistent, which actually kind of feels a bit of like a bit of a departure from... The last couple of sets, well, uh, which is interesting. Let me hit you with the devil's advocate. Okay, go on. Legendary. One card in your deck. Spiky, high variance. Kind of annoying, to be honest. Like, I mean, just, I guess in my experience with legendaries in the past is like, they're not- I'm talking limited, by the way. Okay. I'm talking limited. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so my experience, <laughs> uh, I'll talk constructed, so we're all confused. But uh, yeah, my experience, with, I think you're right. Like, a, a good blues are, are have, have been the backbone of very, very good heroes in Flesh and Blood that have since rotated out. Um, like, yeah. it's a very powerful thing to be able to do is have like, playable blues. Uh, that being said, while it might increase consistency in these heroes, having the one of in your deck is- yeah, it's just extremely high variance. It can be very spiky. It can lead to just, I mean, in my experience, very unfun gameplay. That's how it was with Chain with Soul Reaping. It was just like- I was about to say, you don't love whether you draw or don't draw Soul Reaping? Dude, that card was so <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> like, and you might be like, oh, but it's fun when you get to play it. Mm. I don't know. Depends what, yeah. you, depends what your goal is. If you just want to win and you just want your opponent to suffer, then yeah, it is fun when you play it. I remember having it in my draft, my first draft deck at Nationals last year. <laughs> Obviously, it was Monarch draft yeah. at Nationals. And just being like, okay, well, I feel like I'm about a minus or plus 10% depending on whether I banish this card or get to play it in the game. <laughs> yeah, that feels that feels like you were being conservative with those numbers too. I mean, Monarch, Monarch had... Monarch is... Is Monarch the most bomby limited set in Flesh and Blood history? I think maybe. Yeah, yes, yes, it is. I think so um okay well that's what we've seen so far i mean look that's kind of my my extrapolation of what we've seen so far is that you know i think there's a really interesting piece around the kind of openness of what this means for draft with the mystic like the talent type and then the hero or class sorry class type um for instance you know what we just saw with the attack reaction the mystic the tide chakra uh, i think that's super interesting these all have the the different borders. So I think some of these borders, like the Mystic Assassin border to me looks quite cool, actually. Uh, That's so funny. <laughs> That's the one that like uh, most people say looks like ass. Uh, I like it. Yeah. Is that what they say? I mean, yeah, I really yeah, like yeah, the yeah. earth border though. I like green. I like green and, and card okay, borders. Yeah. I think that one sense. was getting flack. I mean, anecdotal, right? Just from what I saw, that one was getting flack and the others people really, really like. So it's, I mean, it's cool. It's something that you have a, you know, a differing opinion. You like that contrarian, one. clearly. <laughs> I mean, people are, people are simping for these blue borders, you know, the 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 mystic ninja with the kind of blue ninja. I mean, it does look cool. I don't love the bottom of it. And then you've got this. I just don't like illusionist borders because I don't like illusionist, Brendan. So I do like illusionist. I just hope I just hope they give us. Yeah, I mean, my biggest hope for this set, 
Because it's hard. I mean, we're looking at the first early previews. Um, I don't want us to come off as negative when we talk about like legendaries maybe not being the most fun thing about Flesh and Blood. But uh, you coming off negative. I'm excited for the legendary. <laughs> I'm trying to explain to people now that I am excited, <laughs> despite whatever they're trying to pin on me. Um, I hope they give us some very, I don't know, atypical Flesh and Blood decks, like some very non mid range decks, uh, very actually. Just the opposite of heavy hitters. I hope we get some of that mm. to be honest. I won't say heavy hitters was bad, but I would like to see, you know, an ode back to some of the design that was, you know, old school illusionist. I mean, Jeremiah is pretty cool too, but I think there's a lot of potential with this assassin and this illusionist and hell, maybe even the ninja. Yeah. I really, I don't know. I, I'm excited for the set anyway, regardless. Like, I just want to, I want to play more limited. So I really like heavy hitters though. Just, you know, I would play more heavy hitters. I actually kind of sad that we, comparative to Uprising, when we spent nine months with Uprising to spend like three months with heavy hitters, I'm actually a little bit sad. I would have liked another, I would have liked Pro Quest Season to have some limited, but anyway, we've talked about that is what it is. Uh, let's move on. Come on a cookout this week where I'm just going to flick to the YouTube comments quickly and, and uh, peruse a little bit. But if you want to get your questions in, we definitely have some spots for some questions. Come on a cookout questions. We love some nice juicy questions. Maybe you want to ask Brendan something super juicy about his view on legendaries. I don't know. Uh, but if you want to get those in, you can drop them in the YouTube comments below. Let us know that it is a command cookout question that you'd love to have read out on the show because we do just get a lot of random comments on YouTube, which we also love. Keep those coming. Uh, otherwise, you can email us at arsenalpassfab at gmail.com. You can pass a little handwritten note to us at the next event. Do you remember the time someone handed me a note and said a little note on it? That's, that wasn't funny, Brendan. Yeah, we're actually now um, accept, accepting carrier pigeon as well. Yes, yes, um, and turtles. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what, what do you have uh, for us? I just was reading the YouTube comments to see if there was any questions that came up. But my favorite thing is that there's a quote here from uh, Brendan Patrick, 2024. Oh, I saw a lot of wieners. <laughs> I did see a lot of. They didn't add the best part of that quote, by the way, um, which I said, and that's that's a lot, even for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I just want to shout out uh, those who kind of commented on the pod last week. A lot of great discussion and people replying to other comments. Um, a lot of people sort of dropping some comments on uh, the coverage and just how much they enjoy the coverage feeling very similar. Over the week, Brendan, I've watched a bit of the coverage back as well. So I've watched like all of the top eight. Uh, I watched multiple of the Swiss rounds as well. And yeah, I just want to double down on how much I love the content, uh, the, the coverage from, from PTLA. People talking about Fab Draft as well um, and just kind of their view on it. And then a lot of people backing you up, Brendan, on not liking split format. Uh, for surprising, so, I, I usually just get crucified yeah. anytime I talk about <laughs> like any format thing. Um, yeah, well, I'm just honestly the only thing I care about is that people actually understand that I'm not anti limited and I actually am just anti split format at this point. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's like it feels like I've said that a million times, but I don't know. I just like, every time I say it, I feel like I get pushed into a box of like Brennan hates limited, and it's like, no, and it's like, do you like heavy hitters? And I'm like, well, I didn't like it that much. Like, see? And I'm like, fuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got two main topics. We're going to talk a little bit about a world without Dromai. Dromai is about a week. No, sorry. Two weeks away from being Living Legend Brennan. So, we're going to have an interesting ProQuest season where the first week we're going to have Dromai. The second week, we're almost certainly not going to have Dromai. You know, there is a world where Dromai survives for another week or even, I guess, in theory, the whole ProQuest season. It ain't happening, though. No. It's going to hit Living Legend. So we're going to have a split kind of ProQuest season where Dromai is going to probably help define that first week. Um, th there is a world where actually we have no Dromai for ProQuest season. I just want to point that out quickly. There is the Calling Phuket happening. Uh, if the Dromai wins that, then there will be no Dromai for ProQuest season. Can it win a Battle Harden as well? Is there a CC Battle Harden? Uh, is there, I, I'm not sure there is a CC Battle Harden. Okay. Um, I, I'd have to double check that. I did look through the events, and I think it's just... Uh, Phuket before ProQuest season starts. I think the first battle harden might be the first weekend. Let me just double check that because I do have the calendar right here. So we have Phuket 5th to 7th of April, Atlanta, which is the 12th to the 14th. And also there, I'm pretty sure there's another battle hardened as well. Um, is also the same weekend. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a Polish battle harden the same weekend. So those would be the first weekend of, of ProQuest anyway. Uh, so P Phuket is the one that could send it to Living Legend early. So just worth noting, if you are planning to play Dromo for ProQuest Season 1, there is a world where it won't be legal. Yeah. Um, rest I want to talk peace. a little bit about... <laughs> wow, rest in pieces, mate. 
Yeah. I'm okay with drama leaving. <laughs> I think it's a fantastically so, designed hero. I, I want to say that before we, we talk about how nice it's going to be when it leaves. One of the coolest things Flesh and Blood has done, as soon as they revealed Urser and Blasphemet back in Monarch, I was like, what if you just had a hero that could do this? That, that just summoned um, like allies. And I think Jeremiah was just a, a great execution of that. And then they decided to throw it all in the garbage with Tome of Imperial Flame. So, you know, here we are. I could, you know what the, you're being partly satirical, but I actually completely agree. <laughs> I know you <laughs> like, do. That, that's actually how I feel. Like, I, I, I thought Jeremiah was a very interesting... I, I'm not going to say balanced because I don't think it's even necessarily balanced, but I think balanced in terms of the fact that it wasn't so powerful that it was going to necessarily define formats. And then they did. They printed Tome of Imperial Flame. And I think that made that, that hero uninteresting. Honestly, that is how I feel. Um, but anyway, that I've spoken enough about that. Let's talk about A World Without Dromai. Mm. Where does the format go? I think, you know, if I'm listening to this pod, Brendan, and I'm, and I'm hearing Brendan Patrick talk about Flesh and Blood, Hayden Dale talking about Flesh and Blood, and I'm heading to my pro quest in week two. The Marvel Kano's out for all to see. Okay. Would you want to start there? Yeah. Kano surely gets a bump, I agree right? with you. Oh, I mean, my God, yes. Like, this is... I feel like this week one, week two, at least, is the time to play Kano. Not only is it the funnest deck to play, and if you're... You know, it's a cool deck that does cool things. It's played by cool people. Um, I just think that week... Like, at least week two. Yeah, week one might still have some Jemai, which is a fine matchup for you. It's just like 25% of the deck actually absolutely just like bends you over, so you have to not see that. Um, Kano is super well positioned because I feel like everybody is going to go towards the Warriors as mm. uh, Jemai leaves, as well as, of course, KO, which is usual suspect. But, man, that week two Kano meta is going to be so good. And just for people that don't know... Yeah, but they are, you can bring as much arcane barrier as you want. Like it's just not it's not going to be a good matchup for you as a warrior, and it's mm. it's a flip for you as a KO. Even with no fears, even with taking on the chins, even with Oasis or Spite, just doesn't matter. Yeah, the 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 thing that's tough for Kano is pressure plus disruption, right? And Kasai, Dorinthia, whatever they can pack in the disruption but can they necessarily push on the pressure and i think dorinthia does it best honestly i think dawnblade dorinthia does the pressure the best um i think kasai and hatchets or axes um dory does it a lot worse so i agree i think let's talk level one i think level one is the warriors get a bump right like i i, I agree with you on kano i'll yeah, get there yeah. in a second uh, i'll we'll go back to the church of kano over here it's a niche deck um, so it's a niche deck <laughs> it's such a niche deck yeah clearly at this point but I think I think Kasai and Durantia are kind of like level one of who get a bump, and probably more so Kasai. I think I think Kasai's worst matchup in this last format was was Kano. I th I, that's how I feel anyway. And I know the the Kasai players on our team, including one Mister Matt Dilks, who won a calling on Kasai. Yes, went down to AB two because one Mister Brennan Patrick cooked him round one of the PT. Uh, on Kano, and I think Matt was just like, I mean, this matchup kind of means it just nothing does, to me. It, it just doesn't matter, right? Like, because if yeah. you think about the just like the economy of cards that are in the deck, the access to resources the deck has, like, it, like AB three is great when I'm playing Wildfire, and I guess when mm -hmm. I spindle. But outside of that, it's like all you're doing is playing into exactly what I'm trying to do. You might be mitigating some some chip damage, some chip damage, but ultimately, my entire goal is like double spell on my turn, take cards out of your hand, you either pass your turn or you play out a card. And in that case, it's like, then I'm going to combo you. And you have a limited amount of resources. Like, this is why the difference yeah. between like Arcane Bear and Spell Void is so drastic is because Arcane Bear is not, it doesn't actually do anything. It is completely codependent <laughs> on... The, the cards you have in your hand, which are also being used for mul multiple other things. So, yeah. yeah, I think AB2 is totally fine. You might die from a higher life total sometimes, but c'est la vie. Uh, the reason I think Kasai in particular is how I'm always picking a bump is I think Dromai was, I think it's a bad matchup for you. I don't think, you know, I think a lot of people came into this event as warriors with plans for, for Dromai. I think the really experienced Dromais and those who had tested a lot knew about these plans and were prepared for them. Um, it often meant kind of going to fatigue a lot of the time, going long. Uh, you know, a lot of these Kasai's were playing like 9 to 14 poppers in their deck. I think the big bump for, for Kasai is you no longer need to do that. You get a lot of deck equity in terms of the space uh, that you have for fixing potential other matchups or just having some potential different plans in your deck. I think... One thing that Kasai was really lacking, especially when it played into something like Dorinthia, for instance, is like you just have like no attack reactions in your deck because you have to fill it with poppers. 
Kasai no longer needs to do that. And I think Kasai is quite an interesting starting point for week two of the meta. Um, I think it's something that I'm personally looking at potentially playing. I I actually don't fundamentally like Kasai. I think fundamentally Kasai is a little bit underpowered, which we can, you know, I guess we can dive into that at some point. But I think when you get to put more attack reactions in your deck and get to kind of utilize the fact that you can definitely push gold, that's when it starts to get really powerful. Mm. And my problem with Kasai previously is that it was really hard to make gold because you had to fill your deck with all these poppers and things like that. Whereas if I get to play more attack reactions and I get to, every time I activate the Kasai ability, if I'm almost guaranteeing I'm going to create a gold, I raise an army, which is the most above rate card in that deck when it's when it's in the right spot, is going to be um, where I'm going to be at. So yeah, I think Kasai gets bumped. Yeah. I, uh, my only experience against Kasai is on the Kano side and like that deck just <laughs> looks like, so, it looks so bad when it plays against Kano because it just doesn't do, it doesn't do any of the unfair things. Like it can basically never create gold. It's like playing two card hands and like maybe pumping for three on a single blade. It's like hoping to God it gets a, it gets a go again, access to go again. It's just like, man, it's rough. Yeah. I mean, this, this, you know, it's not an unwinnable matchup as we saw, right? And the calling final. Um, but it's definitely not a good matchup, and I think things have to go your way for sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk KO. I think KO is best deck in format. I don't think that's changed, uh, and I think KO is losing a bad matchup. I honestly think, my, from my testing and from what I heard from others, and yep. obviously what we saw at the PT with Arthur Trehe, you know, taking down multiple KOs, not only in top eight, but through Swiss. Um, I, I just think it was a good matchup for for Jerome. I KO kind of had to high roll to win that matchup, and and it, the longer the game went, the more it was favored to to Jerome. So I think KO was losing a bad matchup. The other thing KO was losing is a bad matchup that also meant that you had to have play specific cards. I mm-hmm. think I think of cards like Gambler's Gloves. I think it was correct to play Gambler's Gloves. I think it was also correct to have more access to true poppers, cards that had defensive value and popped. Um, KO no longer has to worry about having necessarily poppers. I think Prism is going to be around. We can talk a little bit about Prism in a second. But yeah, I think KO gets a, a really big bump. Best deck in format. And I think only gets better with the second best deck in format, probably um, hitting Living Legend and being a bad matchup for KO. Do you think that Prism is a, has a good matchup into KO? No, I do not. Okay, 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 okay. Just making sure because that was that was like my takeaway from testing, but I had also seen some differing opinions online. And it was like the it was the ones that smell like copium were like the the prism pilot just clearly doesn't know the trigonometry to win it's just like okay but yeah it seems nah, it was played a lot and like uh the the testing group were a part of that 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 matchup was played quite a bit um because for a second there was some some prism huffing but yeah i mean i would huff that deck too if it didn't have a bad matchup in the best deck in the format let's talk quickly about prism though because i think prism lost one of its bad matchups in Jeremiah. and to be fair because of the als combo loop um that prism has access to which is this kind of infinite you know you can keep repeatedly playing the als in conjunction with the um with the figment that was really strong and that actually could beat dromai you could actually beat dromai pretty consistently with that but if they had time skippers then you you auto lost my advice is if you ex- i think prism gets a big bump as well because i think you've lost a, a particularly bad matchup in the traditional sense that one that you had to basically combo to beat um so i think and also illusionist players are going to move from Drome to Prism. So I think Prism just naturally gets bumped. You're going to see it played. My advice is if you're expecting Prism to be played at your event and you're playing anything that's not uh, something like KO or a popper heavy aggressive deck, probably play Time Skippers. Uh, the ALS loop is not that hard to set up. It does take life. It does take them getting something into soul. But if you don't have ways to prevent that or ways to put pressure on, they will They will do it. Uh, so you might want a Time Skippers in your deck. Yeah. The Prism matchup is uh, not great for Kano. That's one downside. No, it might be the one of the worst matchups in Flesh and Blood history. Oh no, no, no! I mean, maybe up until now, but as soon as this new this new illusionist comes out, that that looks like a true <laughs> auto loss, like a true illusionist. Yeah, El illusionist. illusionist. Yeah, turbo blue, fucking zero cost <laughs> oasis or spite illusionist. Yeah, go next. Brand's favorite. Let's talk quickly. I think the other three decks that I had on my list of of things that get a bump and things that I'd be looking at post a world with Dromai leaving is Max Dash, so the mechanologist, uh, just because their matchup into Dromai was not particularly great. Uh, not that it was, I honestly think it was around like a 40% matchup. I don't think it was necessarily terrible, but I think, you know, losing a, a highly prevalent 40% matchup is only good for you, uh, depending on where the meta goes. And then Reinar, I think as well. I think the way my view is the way to build Reinar right now meant that your matchup into 
into Jeremiah was not particularly good. I just think Jeremiah has good a good brute matchup, honestly. I think Levi is the scariest, but I just think he had a good brute matchup. Um, so those are the other three decks I think get a bump. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I want to finish off before we... We're going to get into some history of Arsenal Pass and a few things to celebrate the three-year pod anniversary, Brendan. But I want to ask you a question. If your name wasn't Brendan Patrick, what would you play for ProQuest season in week two onwards with Draw My Gun? Yeah, if you can't play Kano, I think you should play Kano. Like, it's like the best meta condition I've ever seen for the deck. Other than maybe... Like, you could argue maybe PT1 is better, but in PT1, you still have to dodge Prisms, which was like a terrible matchup. Like... Yes, these people will be- I beat Prisms at PT1. Yeah, that's <laughs> anecdotal, and that is not representative of a good match. Um, I went one too. Yeah. I went one too. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so even if people are prepared for Kano, like, the top decks that are showing up, like, it just doesn't really change that much about the matchup. So I think if you've ever wanted to play Kano at events, like competitive events, um, this mm -hmm. is the time. So even though my name is, in fact, Brendan Patrick, I will, <laughs> I mean, I just, there's no way you could convince me to play anything other than Kano. Also, I'm pretty, I'm definitely putting down, like, playing any sort of mid-rangey, like, fair flesh and blood deck for, like, a long time. Like, I, mm -hmm. what I enjoy about flesh and blood and what it does for me as a TCG and how it separates itself are, are decks like Kano, OG Prism, Chain, what even could be now, like Max Nitro, the new Prism, et cetera. Like, I guess I'm just a Johnny. Like, I'm, those, I like those decks. And if those decks didn't exist in Flesh and Blood, the game wouldn't offer, like, anything yeah. to me, to be honest. So I'm playing those decks. I, I really like that we have access to those decks. I was to a Max at um, The Calling in LA. And I, yeah, I, I like that those decks exist as much as I didn't in that moment, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's it's KO. I think it's KO or Kasai, honestly. I mean, K I think Kano's great. Basically, I think the three best kind of options when once Dromai hits Living Legend is is the Ks. It's all about the Ks. It's Kano, Kasai, and KO. It's like a Kardashian over here, you know what I'm saying? I think those three are, <laughs> are the three best decks in the format. Um, Dorinthia is interesting. I'm not sure where Dorinthia slots into that, and that's kind of the, the question, I think. And then Prism is maybe a little bit of an outlier. But then there's, yeah, there's other decks in there. I think... Victor is still interesting, but I think if, you know, you have to play Victor into Kano, Kasai, and Ko, like, I think Victor's in a pretty bad spot, actually, so. Yes, sir. But anyway, Fire Priest, Brendan Patrick, says Kano, of course. <laughs> yes, for sure. Best deck in Flesh and Blood. I had somebody that I know pretty well was like, Oh, they like they, they were talking about Kano, like, oh yeah, it's it's uh it's all variants until the second cycle. I was like, oh man, <laughs> that is wild that people believe that. Like, I think that a lot of people who hate on Kano, like, actually just fundamentally don't understand the deck at all. It's crazy. Like that, the, if you think that Kano is a second cycle variants deck, like that's wild. Kano is very much a you can be played both ways, but the first cycle for the first cycle version of Kano is is not a high variance like flip off the top deck like whatsoever. I don't know. I, it, it's just anecdotal. It just came up the other day, and I was just like, what? I was like, what the fuck? People believe this? I mean, there is some first cycle variants, right? Like, but there's it's first minimal. cycle variants in every yeah, single yeah. day. Well, okay. But people on, think that on, you're literally just play, activating Kano, like, YOLO activating Kano on your opponent's turn, and like, yeah, no, never, reds. never. That's, yeah. that's always terrible. Um, but you are doing it in your turn, and sometimes you hit absolutely dog on your own turn, like blue zap into blue sap, and Hell then yeah. you. <laughs> Say crap. All right. History of Arsenal Pass. How did we meet, Brendan? Uh, Hayden and I met. So we got a gig. So we met via Sasha Markovic. We got a gig to cast a Blitz Calling. I don't know if any of you guys got to watch it. It was quite an epic event. There was a 2019 bl Blitz Calling. Um, 2020, we, I think, right? I think it was actually the end of 2019. I think it was. I could be wrong. Uh, February 2020. I know exactly what okay, it was. Okay, okay. Um, which is famous for the camera overheating. <laughs> it was very Ira dominated, but basically Hayden and I got the gig to cast that remotely. It was ridiculous. I think it was a 15 hour. It was, some, it was over 12 hours for sure. Um, I, I remember starting at noon and going till 4 or 5 a.m. Um, yeah, the technology was also not fantastic, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was a bonding experience because it was so brutal, and that that is actually how we met was casting the the blitz the blitz calling in twenty early twenty 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 one twenty twenty one basically 
Yeah, it's the month before we started Arsenal Pass. Okay, I, I, I just double checked my math on that one. Yeah, twenty twenty one. I just looked it up. So, because twenty nineteen was the first calling yeah, the circuit yeah. series. Twenty twenty, you and Mister Markovic went to Auckland for the CC. Yeah, and then COVID, and then twenty twenty one. I I did that. know about Hayton though because uh, I don't know if anybody is. Uh, knows this but he's been simping brute for a while and sasha and i were playing a fatigue deck at the first auckland calling and there was like this little whisper around the water cooler that hayden was going to bring brute which theoretically would have been a terrible matchup for a fatigue deck because just pitch stack intimidate everything um etc but yeah hayden didn't make it out so history yeah, was like history boy. went the other way went to sasha yeah. <laughs> um people there's some questions i curated so on this past i guess weekend not weekend before actually ptla had a few questions about arsenal pass and um also a few of the boys kept uh, repeating the theme tune to me which we'll get to in a second but how did we come to the name brendan arsenal pass mm, we got in a group chat in discord or just like i think it was like my discord or something and then we were just brainstorming names 98 percent of which were extremely inappropriate they were just riffs <laughs> off of things in flesh and blood kind of like command and cookout is um, and I forget who suggested Arsenal Pass, but I remember I was I was pretty high on it. I don't know if I remember you were high on it, Hayden, but I'm, I think there was a bit of like a dichotomy. Like some people were like, no, that name sucks. <laughs> I was just like, but uh, I think that was one of the best choices we ever made, by the way, was making the name Arsenal Pass because, I mean, still to this day, bro, I sit down at a calling, someone to my left or my right says Arsenal Pass <laughs> to proceed in the game state. Yeah. And there's like, Great name for a podcast. I'm like, Shit. Good podcast, yeah. <laughs> never. That's the first time I've ever heard that one. Uh, yeah, I never heard that joke before, but it, is, it ended up being great, great uh, marketing and a little stroke of genius on on our behalf. I, I don't even know if it was us, honestly. There was a couple other people on the call as well mm -hmm. that were, were helping us brainstorm. So, um, do you any? Do you remember any of the names off the top of your head that you want to? The you really share? inappropriate ones. I actually don't. I was just thinking this whole time, but the, it, they were they were rough. For sure. They were <laughs> was it any that almost made the cut? I mean, Commander Cookout yeah, was like Yeah, plus one intellect almost made the cut. That's right. That's right. I really liked um, Spark of Genius, which ended up being <laughs> taken by a, a, a YouTube channel in the future, actually. But that was one that I had, I was pretty high on that I was kind of bullish about. Yeah, I thought well. at the time. So at the time, the, the content scene was like very immature like there's basically yeah, no basically content didn't exist. <laughs> i felt like spark of genius was a bit too arrogant not saying that the people that made that channel eventually are arrogant but back then it was like it was a bit too on the nose i felt like even plus one intellect was a stretch that's why i think we we shied away from those for that reason specifically yeah i agree um well i'll tell you what what we might do is if we ever find those names we might share them on patreon I'm, i don't feel necessarily comfortable sharing them on on the main feed oh yeah they were they were something they were <laughs> a little insight into how mine and brendan's uh, brains work um what was the pod meant to be originally i said this someone last, asked me this yeah. the other day yeah i said this last week it was meant to be limited resource so it was meant to be like uh karen mcintaggart and uh carol uh i can't say his last name carol r <laughs> have moved on to legendary Switch. studios maybe it's a good time to start a podcast so yeah a bit of opportunistic there it was also I mean, there's a document that we absolutely probably can share on Patreon, which is the original uh, proposition for Arsenal Pass. I don't know if it was edited, but the original proposition was basically to copy limited resources, uh, the F Magic the Gathering podcast. And and when I say copy, I mean copy. I mean, we were only <laughs> going to do limited reviews and limited stuff. Yeah. We thought we could do a weekly podcast just about limited. Oh, could you imagine? We probably could now, but yeah, I think- It'd be a stretch. Think, yeah. It'd be a stretch. I mean, we have obviously- We've come to some limited content as well. Shout out to What's well, Time Only, obviously. All right. What about the intro song, the music? People yes. tell me they. I, this is the most polarizing thing I, that I've heard in terms of our podcast. Is people either they love the intro, they play it in their car and repeat, or they friggin' hate it, Brendan. Yeah. How did we get to this intro song that's now been the intro for almost three years? It actually wasn't our intro for the first couple of weeks, but. Yeah. I think it ultimately is. it's iconic at this point. Like it evokes. Like, I don't know, the podcast. Like, it, it just makes sense. Like, I don't particularly like it. I skip it every time if I ever go back to listen to see if there's an issue with the podcast. Um, like, I'll double click my phone so it fast forwards. But, like, it is very Arsenal Pass's point. I don't know if we could ever get rid of it. But, um, yeah, where did it come from? 
so historically, actually, I had people come up to me and they were like, oh my God, who does the voice? It sounds so, it sounds so good. This was back in the calling Vegas, like 2021 or 2022, probably 2022. And I was like, it's actually, that's, cr-. and I was with Dante Del Fico. I was like, it's actually crazy you asked because it's actually Dante Del Fico's voice, but it's been remixed and tweaked a bit. And he was like, holy shit, Dante, you did such a good job on that. And we left it there. We left there. Ultimately, that's that's somebody on Fiverr that we hired to do that for us. And they did a pretty good job, to be honest. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, first time we met in person. Is that the calling Orlando? Yeah, US Nationals, November 2021, I think. So about, about seven or eight months into the podcast starting, I think. We recorded an episode in person. I think it was episode 50-ish. Mm. It, the funnest, in my opinion, the funnest Easter egg about Arsenal Pass is go back to the old episodes and look at how much Hayden and I both leaned out. Like, I don't know if we were actually <laughs> lower weight in terms of numbers, but we were definitely a, a bit more, we carried a bit more pudginess on us back then. It's just funny because I remember I was, I, sh- I screenshot a few of them to Hayden because I went back and listened recently and I was like, dude, you look so different. <laughs> like, it's crazy. And I do remember specifically in Orlando, like, yeah, you've definitely done a lot of work since then. <laughs> hey, thanks, bro. It's true. <laughs> it's- I'm definitely not lighter than I was. But that, yeah, but it, it is funny. It. If you go back to any of the old episodes, like you'll see that it could just be getting older too, partly. Like just, I don't mm-hmm. know, not being whatever, 25 anymore. But it is interesting to see the change there. I listened to some old episodes and in, in, well, parts of old episodes in preparation for this podcast because we're going to talk about some of our favorite episodes uh, very soon but yeah it's um i i tell you what i cringed a little bit at some of the the really early episodes so my recommendation is uh, don't listen to those oh i listen to them <laughs> and I, I like them actually i like them uh, speaking the, of my quality was not great though yeah no it wasn't we apologize uh speaking of early episodes people may not know this if you've you know only been a listener of arsenal pass in probably the last two years really but we also had a kind of secondary podcast that we ran most weeks as well called time in the round brendan do you remember time in the round yes i do we have actually we have a whole nother one too it's called state of the meta <laughs> uh it just didn't run as long so time of the round was actually running weekly and it was just like bringing people on in the community and interviewing them kind of like what flakes podcast is now um yeah. at the time no one was doing that though and i think one of our kind of things is we wanted to share the love a little bit and and um share some spotlight on on other creators other players you know we're big i think we're really big on narrative right mm-hmm. you know we talk about it a lot when it comes to like pt coverage we love the narratives um it's a big part of what we loved about magic coverage for instance and so we were trying to create that a little bit and now obviously there's there's people who do that a lot better when it comes to interviews and things so we, we stopped doing that but I, I used to love that that pod it was quite fun i actually really liked that pod i liked it until i didn't like it like i liked it when mm-hmm. it was really interesting and we got into like we got to have like good conversations and then when sometimes it didn't go that way uh it was just like, it wasn't really worth it because it's like hard to force out that type of content because you're not like extracting yeah. like someone's knowledge of a metagame. You're like extracting personal details and you're trying to make it also entertaining and interesting. It's like, I'll let other people do that. I'll let other people do mm-hmm. it. Some of the other things we've done over the, the past three years as well, limited time only, obviously has been a, something that I've been super proud that we've, we've done. I love limited content. We've had Yuha come in and do season two of limited time only in the past few weeks. Uh, season one was around what, what set was season one outsiders yeah outsiders. Uh, and, but actually that that stemmed from basically making some content from the farewell to welcome to wraith a lot of people might not have played that but there was basically when the print run ceased for unlimited for welcome to wraith they did this big farewell to welcome to wraith event this draft events with like uh cold foil young heroes for the first time and the welcome to wraith heroes being available and basically there's this big this big draft events and for that we produced this these welcome to Rave draft guides that just kind of popped off honestly and people asked for more so that kind of spawned what limited time only has become and i think that's something that you'll continue to see stay around which i'm excited about i listened to limited time only quite a few times for casting pro tour baltimore and i just remember being in the booth and i would like regurgitate something um as if it was my own idea of course and then i remember Oops. like one of the cast next to me like mm, i'm not sure if i agree with you i'm like you're not disagreeing with me you're disagreeing with alan wow and uh he's better <laughs> than you so <laughs> and he's currently playing for top eight so. <laughs> um gameplay we also did a number of gameplay videos which brendan i actually went back through mm-hmm. so we've done over 20 gameplay videos okay do you want to know i went and checked the record do you oh, want to know wow. the record in our gameplay videos is it 15 5 
So, if you're in your car right now or you're at home, you're listening on YouTube, who do you think has the most wins when it National comes to National champion, Brandon? calling champion, pro tour, almost pro tour top 16, like consistent player. Hey, multiple pro tour top 16. Thank yeah. you very much. Consistency. I did me. not win many games against Brendan. No, I, I think it's uh, seven t- uh, sorry, 13 and 7. So, it's not as bad. It's not as bad as I thought. But it's not counting CFB more. shit though, because we did stuff no, for CFB not. and I was smoking you on those ones too. Yeah, because you were playing like chain into Azalea, <laughs> dude. <laughs> but anyway, Brendan has won a lot of games on camera against me, but not so much on camera against anyone else. I actually else. flipped that around. <laughs> I've won like my last two on camera, actually. Have you? Okay. Um, nice. Yes, yeah, I'm not. I'm no. I'm no Isaac Olsen. I think he's like 05 sure. on camera, uh, round one too. Um, yeah, it is funny. It is really funny. I think that, so what Hayden said is true. So part of it is like, sometimes when we were doing those, de- those game plays, like I was very vocal or adamant, or I guess in a way kind of known for like a specific meta deck and because it was chain. So Hayden was like, oh, I guess I'll play the other deck. Well, it <laughs> wasn't a lot of very competitive decks against chain. I'll say that. But there was absolutely some bullshit ones where I would win with like terrible heroes. <laughs> like I, I beat you with Bravo when you were playing Prism, I think. Um, yeah. My boy Bravo. Yeah, it was, it, it's, it's an anomaly to say the least. Some of these as well we were playing when the sets first dropped without kind of necessarily a, a great handle on the game plans. I think as well if we, we played games now, I think that not saying that they would look different from a win percentage side, just that they would look different in general. I think there's just so much more uh, knowledge gained in early parts of formats that we could utilize in our gameplays. Like at those, those times, a lot of those gameplays, like we were just building freshly or sleeving up decks and, and playing without a lot of game plan knowledge which i think yeah. exists now honestly 90 percent of my brain power was uh devoted to not making game state errors because if you yep. do it's like the whole thing is done you can't you have to just trash it honestly that's that's a big part of i think what made making gameplay content difficult was that we're doing it remotely we're also running the production side of it and all the audio visual side of it and trying to make sure that's perfect while also trying to play a game and maintain game state so um the in- in-person gameplay that i've done with with nick since for the mm-hmm. last couple of sets we didn't do anything for heavy hitters but we did in the last the two sets previous was a bit easier to produce because you're in person um yeah. but i think actually if we do that again we're probably a third person like spotter honestly or person who can look after the all the equipment yeah for sure i honestly the nail in the coffin for me was when we did the blitz stuff for legend store studios which is nothing they didn't do anything wrong um mm-hmm. but like we got the gig to do it and it made it the gauntlet series yeah the the first gauntlet we series. created the gauntlet series yeah. we created that that was what yeah. we, we pitched that to lss yeah but playing playing blitz dynasty yeah it was just tough and we had like a lot of uh game state error stuff so we had a lot of recording issues like it was brutal to be honest yeah it was tough uh, I want to kind of flick through quickly some of our most viewed content for those that may not know, maybe your pod only listeners, uh, but our YouTube content with set reviews, obviously have always been a big part of what we do and continue to do. Brendan, uh, they tend to get kind of the most views, which, you know, makes sense. The chain deck tech uh, and anything related to the chain deck got yeah. quite, a, quite a lot of views, Brendan. The Kano deck tech that I did post worlds is still our, our most viewed video. I don't know if you know that. Um, I do. Apparently pe- people, people talk to me about the video you all the time. You are known as the Kano guy. Which is insane. Stole the thunder. <laughs> he stole the thunder. <laughs> nah. It's just because I made that video. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Like, it, it's to be fun- fair, I did top 16 two PTs with it. I think that's why people refer yeah, to it. Yeah. But uh, the Nationals winning Viserai deck, Yuki's Lexi deck that Yuki did a tech tech with us on. And then my favorite one that is one of our top, top five or top six or something most viewed videos, if people haven't seen this. It was a video, this basically, this is the law to this video. The video is called the Saber Bolton video or emergency uh, <laughs> Saber Bolton video. Brendan messages me before Vegas and goes, okay, we've been playing against this Bolton Saber deck. No one knows how this deck works and people just keep losing. This deck is terrible. People just lose to it because they don't know how to block. And I was like, okay, I don't disagree. And he's like, we should make a video on this immediately. And I was like, okay. And so we make a video basically on how the combo works, the Saber Bolton combo works, how to block it, how to beat it. and People blow up like in terms of like, oh, this is great. Thank you for this. Or people losing it of like, you hate Bolton no. so much. You made a video yeah. just just people to make like, propaganda on how yeah. to beat it. They were like, you ruined like uh, the because the, it was in it was coming up to the Vegas calling. They're like, wow, it's like a week before you like spoiled it. Like, it's just like, 
Yeah, okay. All the Timmies, the, the only game plan they have is to serendipitously draw two Luminos together. It's like, yeah, your deck is a little bit worse now. Too bad. And then what happened at Vegas? I lost to it, yeah. I got... <laughs> yeah, I got... Yeah, I got smoked. So that's, that's how the deck works. So, like, you can block it, but uh, when, they, when they rub them together, you know, they get all... They draw, it, it can be rough. But uh, that, deck, mm. it, that deck is a freaking pipe dream. It's gone now, but the whole Luna no, combo it's still deck... Around. <laughs> I don't know. It's I think the the Bolton deck is much better now, and it has a fridge. But that yeah, yeah. the the OG Bolton combo deck was one of the most ass decks I've ever seen in a TCG. This is the guy who just talked about all the Johnny decks that he likes. But yeah, they're also ass. I'm not saying they're good decks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, the lore around that video just makes me crack up every time. The fact that you lost to it at, at Vegas was the, the that's how it goes, bro. That's how it goes. <laughs> Um, I sat down across, and I think his name is Nick, and I was like, oh, fuck. I, know. I was like, I, karma is going to get me here. <laughs> Twitter spaces? Yep, Twitter spaces. Honestly, like, I feel like um, I slash we were kind of some of the first people on Flesh and Blood Twitter, like, in the early days. I could be wrong, but I do think that, like, Flesh and Blood wasn't very much, like, Flesh and Blood in the community was not on Twitter in like the first one, two, three years. It's pretty small. Yeah, it's pretty small. Very small. Yeah, yeah. And then we started doing Twitter Spaces, which is really cool. And Tark did them a lot. And yeah, I, I enjoyed Twitter Spaces. I think Twitter now is a bit of a war zone. So, I mean, I might stay away from this. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I mean, we, we always talked about it. It's funny because if we, if you actually listen back to all the pods, we talk a lot about Twitter and how great it was back in the day and like how awesome the conversation because honestly a lot of the times you were just talking to people you knew in real life that you know either were your friends or they were acquaintances and like people were pretty amicable not the same anymore um, and we always talked about that we we knew it was going to go this direction like it is just the inevitable direction of these sort of online forums and spaces which is okay but uh back in the day it was it was honestly a joy uh to engage on like og flush mud twitter mm-hmm. <clears throat> then obviously making a bunch of content um, for some of us, you know, moving across to the coverage side of it as well, mm-hmm. you know, to the other side of, of things. And then I just, just want to give you this opportunity to reflect on your journey is obviously you have, you have other podcasts now as well um, oh. that create content for other yeah. games, but just any reflections of yourself as a content creator and, and podcaster. Like I listen to some old episodes and phew, I, I don't know how people listen to me. I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how people still listen to me, Brendan, but Arsenal, Arsenal Past taught me the model on how to make a successful podcast in the TCG space. Maybe just a successful podcast in general. Um, I know that sounds arrogant, but there really, there really is a model. And I think a lot of it comes down to people misunderstand podcasting as something that is like, oh, people listen to us because we have good conversations or like I impart value. And I think imparting value is high up on the tier list of something you need to do in a podcast, but it's not the end all be all. The end all be all by far, number one, is you have to be entertaining. And sometimes that means that when you have two two personalities, like you have to take roles, right? Like someone has to be uh, kind of the host and the other has to be the one with sometimes trash opinions, but you have to evoke some emotion and some sort of uh, like discussion. Because like the worst thing a podcast can be is just like this lukewarm, directionless kind of like conversation. And yeah, I, Arsenal Pass really taught me about that. And I was able to literally reverse engineer Arsenal Pass. Like it is the exact same model. It is the exact, it's the, like y- if anybody listens to multiple podcasts I do, they'll see. It's like, it's got the question section. It's got host. It's got expert. Um, it's got the same CTAs. Like it is very, very similar. And it's got the same kind of value props when it comes to card game level ups. But this podcast mm-hmm. is what taught me everything about that. Not to mention all the back end shit, like how to, how to get reviews, how to rank high in SEO, how to get audio right, how to get thumbnails right, how to like all of that stuff came from Arsenal Pass, to be honest. And it's crazy how like, I think to the point where we, like how much we learned over the past couple of years, like I think there is a clear model and not to be like the biggest, best content creator in the world. But if you want to have like a solid podcast, I think that there is like a, a pretty consistent model that you can follow at least to get off the ground. And yeah, it worked twice now. So it's nice. just going back, you said the, the role of a, of a host yeah, and then you're the, the host. Of, uh, I'm the one with the and, trash and ex- dude. Yeah, yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> I don't know if I've told you this, but it's actually the opposite on my other podcast. Like, I am hardcore host, hardcore like just direction. Rarely give my opinion. 
But on this, because you have more of a host role, I feel like you just naturally kind of fall into the host role a bit more. Like, like not saying that you don't have like competitive opinions and things like that, but it's just like the dynamic. It, it just falls into that. And we've talked about switching it up, but we just kind of fall back into it in Arsenal Pass. Um, yeah, like on Arsenal Pass, I say things that I don't, it's not that I don't believe them, but it's not like I wouldn't, I wouldn't die on a hill for a lot of these opinions. Like they're kind of just, yeah, you know, some of them are slightly hyperbolic. Some of them are meant to be entertaining. Like, like I feel like the the dynamic and the push and pull is really important. So yeah, it, it it's funny because if you if you listen to the other podcasts, they're completely opposite. Like I am one hundred percent host and rarely give uh like my opinion on things. I want to talk some high level things over the past three years before we wrap up the pod, Brendan? I want to talk stats. This one's really interesting to me. Yeah, We've done three hundred and forty eight <laughs> videos, one hundred fifty six episodes, which means more than half of the content we've put on YouTube is not podcast videos, Brendan. Wow. <laughs> Doing wow. Uh, three years. Six times we've seen each other in person, been together in person. Over 30 deck techs and over 20 game plays. That's insane. It's crazy. Um, like, especially if you think about, I've thought about this before, just like the hours of conversation that we have recorded on internet in, you know, su- supposedly perpetuity is actually kind of ridiculous. Like mm-hmm. hundreds of hours at this point. Yeah, you can show your kids in like 10 years. Like, this is me, oh Arsenal Pass episode <laughs> one. This is like, uh, <laughs> this is vanilla Hayden. Favorite episodes? I mean, I've got, I've got a couple yeah. uh, that I kind of put down. I think, you know, the Michael Hamilton math episode, kind of where we brought Michael Hamilton on after his US Nationals win with the Icelander deck to kind of spread the good word about math and fab and, and how to evaluate cards and, and decks, I think was, was really interesting. Um, the first episode we did with Brian when we when he was working for Alesis, so the second time we had him on to talk about design and future design, I think was really eye opening and generated a lot of future conversation on on pods we've had. So that was just after Di- no after Dynasty, I think. Yeah, just after Dynasty, right? Um, the first time he came on, I thought it was. Well, he came on. He came on before he was even when. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of casting, course, of course, of course. Yeah. He came on time of the round, by the way. <laughs> or some shit like that. But uh, he came on like pre Dusseldon. Um, I believe, like, release the Saldan. That's right. Uh, some of my other favorites, episode 89, which is uh, top five new player level ups. So, so these episodes, I think, are worth going back and listening to. I think these are some of the, the best ones we've done. Episode 1112, The Power of Consistency. I think that pod is going to live in my mind for, forever because I think that is going to be something we keep coming back to, uh, The Power of Consistency in Flesh and Blood. I don't think that's going anywhere. Or it could be this archaic relic mm. of what Flesh and Blood used to be. Episode 65 was Choosing a Hero really enjoyed making that episode with with you mr brennan patrick uh yeah, also in some of these old episodes you don't talk about kano as much which is um is, is quite nice in some some ways <laughs> it's bad branding. episode 60 was i think one of your favorites which is fair does fab need rotation with Tarek patel so throwing back to you talking about fab rotation a very long time ago yeah. episode 60 and now it is rotating two years ago this is like a this is a fully rotating game at this point it, living legend when it was slower like it technically was still the same thing but i think at the speed at which you rotate now it very much feels like a, a rotating game mm-hmm. uh and then we did some here do you remember the hero yes, 101 i remember episodes. the work that went into those and uh yeah it's a lot i think that those so if i was if i was to look for content especially podcast content on the internet and i didn't have some sort of empathetic or yeah empathetic attachment to uh, a podcaster or a couple of them the kind of episodes i would look for are those especially if i was brand new into the game i would look for just like a full breakdown of each hero what does it do like everything about it but those things were (laughs) they were a lot they were a lot because we went through the whole history and shit too yeah yeah through the classes the cards the heroes um i think the problem with those is that the game started to evolve we tried to choose classes that were kind of evergreen classes um you know we did runeblade we did a big two-parter on runeblade runeblade isn't very relevant now so i think you know if we were to do content like that in the future i think it would look quite different i think it would probably be more video form um and it would be a bit more succinct but those are those are fun to make yeah uh do you got well, a favorite guest there's, there's, there's one okay. episode uh so um uprising set review mm-hmm. hayden it just cooks me for saying lava burst is a tier and he says red hot <laughs> red hot the two cost chain ender is a tier never forget it looked good man red hot in theory looked super powerful it just didn't yeah, the resource curve just didn't play out that way i'm a zero for five gamer <laughs> 
This is true. You got a favorite guest. We've had we've had Tarek Patel on a lot. You know what's funny is we've never had James White on. It's um, true. Three years in. So the I wonder if people wonder why we don't have James White on. It's not because of bad blood, or I mean, maybe at this point because I'm I wouldn't be surprised if they don't <laughs> like some of our opinions. Um, just on the game in general. But the main reason we didn't have James on, um, is because first of all, like never lined up, never made sense. But also, like. He was just on a lot of other podcasts. Like, I mean, it was just hard because, like, every time it, we'd be reminded to have James on again, it was like he just did a podcast. So it's like, mm. uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, so that's why we haven't had him. And we, all, we also talked about having James on, but we want to do it in person. That also mm, never lined up. Um, I think if we ever had a chance to do a podcast with, like, with James in person, we would do that. And I think that we'll probably stick to that. I think that that's how we would want to ultimately execute it is in person. Agreed. But I mean, shit, three years of Arsenal pass. I don't know if they, I don't know if all of our takes on the game have uh, aged like fine wine over there. <laughs> uh, Cecil, why? All right. All right. There's some people we want to have back on the pod and um, some new faces that we're, we're planning to have on the pod this year. So um, stay, yeah. stay tuned. I'm a big guest guy. I really like guests, especially when content is low, which might not be the case in 2024 because, you know, product, product, product. But uh, when, when content is low, I love having like people on that can articulate their thoughts about the game. Like you have it here, but yeah, my, probably my favorite guest. And this might come, I might be forgetting someone, but I think my favorite guest is probably Tarek Patel. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I don't know who my favorite is. I mean, the, the episodes we've done with Brian have been among my favorites. Mm -hmm. So, All right. I think that's going to kind of do it. And this, yeah, we've already talked about favorite episodes, favorite videos, etc. Well, you talk about favorite um, videos, though. Oh, right. Okay. There is, there is one video uh, that I, I think back on fondly, actually, particularly. I mean, there's a few. There's a few. But um, there's a... After or prior to P two one, Brendan knows this very well. I was planning to play Dash at Pro Tour one. It's true. I was planning to I was planning to play this like semi combo, semi aggro boost Dash deck basically, uh, which against the Guardians looked to set up like a triple Teclo Pounder, um, high octane kind of combo turns, and then otherwise was just like this sixty eight card boost Dash pile basically. Because uh, I was just like, this just has the best numbers in the format, and this is kind of before people were talking about numbers really. But I like, I sent Brendan and Sasha like a, a picture of like my my notebook. I was like sitting down gold fishing this deck and being like, look at my average turn damage. Brendan, I was an I was an OG. I was talking about average turn damage before people were talking <laughs> Did about. Did we send it. you a picture of our notebook? Because I think it said like yeah, it said yeah. 32, 42, 42, <laughs> just like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, I think you pointed that out to me when we got in person in New Jersey, but like the kind of the, the day before. But yeah, I mean, I, I was pretty bullish. I was like, this deck is really good. Anyway, I think that deck did end up becoming very, very good. And I, th I think, you know, obviously we saw Dash, Boost Dash win um, the calling in Singapore just prior to Lille and be a big part of that format. But anyway, making that video, uh, one of my favorite things is that I talked about just kind of average turn damage value in that video and talked a lot about max velocity in that card and i got flamed brendan people <laughs> telling me max velocity is unplayable you should be playing the two for six payload instead and people telling me that average damage doesn't matter and all this stuff anyway i just feel vindicated so one of my favorite videos <laughs> yeah um there's been a lot of cooked cooked takes in the past that don't age super well but that's that's the funny thing about the content like on this side of the content is like we're accountable for everything we say to an extent, you know, it doesn't like it's, it's not the end all be all, but then, you know, we have to engage with a lot of people that are not accountable for what they say. So we, I get some wild shit that comes through there sometimes. My favorite, my favorite video by far is a Patreon video. It's the chain deck stacking math. Um, so basically we did an entire spreadsheet of like how to pitch your deck with X number of cards, uh, and sequence counting and like how to do that from turn zero. And yeah, I feel like if you were doing that back in those days, like you were on a completely different level than, Mm -hmm. everybody else um and that was kind of my favorite my favorite thing to do it's actually to mention the person who did the intro it actually comes from dante del fico kind of the thing was is like if you think back to og chain it's probably synonymous with rift bind to an extent but that was absolutely not the fucking case for a while nobody knew about like for some reason nobody really knew about the power of rift bind uh with seeds and like the the rift bind end game and yeah nobody was playing snag as a result and then dante was on stream one time and just like 50 plus <laughs> just absolutely just destroyed his opponent uh with rift bind stacking with seeds of agony um 
And that kind of like sparked our interest in like, oh, does this deck just have literal inevitability? And it's also the best mid-range deck. Like, is it the best aggro slash mid-range deck with inevitability to just combo the opponent out? And the answer was yes. And then we we uh, we stopped doing this recently, but we we told the LSS developers like, hey, this is probably a bit unbalanced. They're like, play snag, lol. And we're like, hmm. Yeah, you guys are behind the curve. <laughs> Same thing with Viscerai. Yeah, you forgot that? Yeah, that's true. That was yeah, when Sasha was working We there. actually told the developers, yeah. <laughs> Same thing with Viscerai and Blitz. So we started playing Viscerai and Blitz uh, before anybody else played it. And a lot of that comes from Matthew Fox as well. That was very much, I think he originated that goldfishing it. Um, but yeah, we told the LSS developers and we're like, oh, you can just like kill people on turn, turn zero, turn one every single time. And they're like, hmm, it's not that good. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we used to tell them when we found broken things. Not anymore. That's pretty funny, actually. Didn't tell them yeah. about wildfire. <laughs> no, no. Um, all right. That's going to do it for <laughs> episode 156. That's three years of Arsenal Pass. A little look behind the curtain on some of the uh, the previous history there, including telling the dire- developers directly, this is broken. <laughs> um, that's the, the good old days. <laughs> I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's been with us on this journey over the last three years, whether that's from day one. Dude, I went back to the first podcast and there's uh, there was two two people who commented on the first pod really? um, that still listen to this pod. Oh, no so, way. One of them was Tom Dowling, Mr. Thomas Dowling. Oh, I that's didn't ridiculous. Know this. Tom, Tom's actually a friend of mine. I didn't know that he had been listening to us for, for that long and, and listened to Is that to before one, he was so. a friend of yours? Yeah, yeah, before, before. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny that's so, so funny. i don't think he's ever told me that which is pretty funny <laughs> um and the other was uh was was a fellow named peter uh i don't know where peter's from i think peter might be from somewhere in in europe okay. um but yeah so what about we've, the, we've uh, had the some... guy that comments every single week like as soon as the pod goes up he's like, great pod guys and you met that person right Oh yeah, he's in Australia. That's um, that's that's Thomas. He's he's here in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Thomas as well. I don't know how long he's been commenting for Awesome Pod, but he he bumps those uh, the algorithm up every week. So we appreciate you. Uh, also, want to say a massive <laughs> thank you to all our patrons who have been there for for so long as well, and um, to to all our new listeners as well. You know, we we love gathering new listeners and having people come and join us on on this journey and being a part of our community. So say a massive thank you, and um, here's to the next year of of podcasts. Ding. On Arsenal Pass, we've got some stuff lined up that we're excited to share with you. So I'll let you take it away, Brennan. Yeah. Well, if you do like the podcast and you're not commenting every single episode like <laughs> like our man, like our man in Australia is, then you can leave us a review on pod platforms, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps a lot, uh, to say the least. Twitter's a brand APG, Fian underscore Dale. And just a final thank you to all those Arsenal Pass patrons. You, you helped us do what we do. And honestly, that's how we probably hit three years. That's how we got to really grow this channel into what it is today. Um, we do have a lot of deck techs coming for a pre ProQuest season. I'm actually playing mm-hmm. ProQuest season. Kano has absolutely ruined me as a TCG player. Like, I tried to play another TCG and I was just like, fuck. <laughs> I want to op- I want to do what I did to PT, which is off 12 cards, draw six cards. Like, it's beautiful. Um, but we got some deck techs coming with some pro tour performing players um and we're gonna have some collaborations hayden's gonna do a deck tech maybe we'll do a kano deck tech post drum i as well even though nothing's gonna change <laughs> but thank y'all so much for listening we'll see you next week